Don't blame socialism for Venezuela's horrors. It's just that the oil price collapsed. And then obviously an oil dependent economy like Venezuela couldn't afford all those imports and public spending anymore. Dead wrong. If the oil price destroyed oil economies like that, why don't thousands of Norwegians pour across the Swedish border every day to escape hunger and violence back home? Because this is just a stupid excuse. Yes, the oil price has come down a little bit, but that's not a collapse. In fact, the oil price hasn't once been below the level of what it was when Hugo Chavez got power in Venezuela early in 1999. Presently, it's almost three times higher than it was back then. Chavez basically got an extra $1,000 billion in oil revenue to spend. But even that wasn't enough for all those social programs and money for cronies. And it certainly wasn't enough to invest in maintaining oil production or finding new sources. So now the oil industry is in ruins and oil output is the lowest it's been in 80 years. Meanwhile, nationalization and price controls destroyed the rest of the economy and created malnutrition in a country that used to export food. Socialism or death, yelled Chavez as he was sworn in as president. His policies has condemned Venezuela to both. And we all know how men are. Just one thing on their mind. You've heard this before. Men think of sex every seventh second. That's dead wrong. Every seventh second? That's almost 8,000 times a day. Wouldn't give us much time to think of sports and beer, would it? This number is all made up. Some people say it's from the famous Kinsey report on sex, but there is no such number there. So a team of researchers tried to find out for real. So they gave students a clicker and asked them to click each time a particular thought crossed their mind. And it turned out that the median man thought of sex on average 19 times a day. Not once every seventh second, more like once per hour. And the difference between the sexes weren't that big. Yes, men thought about it a little bit more, but they also thought more about other things like sleep or food. So perhaps they just counted every fleeting emotion as a thought. And that just proves the futility of the whole exercise. We don't know what we're measuring and we don't know how to measure it. Perhaps it's time for us to just think about something else for a while. Wait, don't forget to subscribe to our channel here and watch these other videos and check back next Wednesday for a new Dead Wrong from Free to Choose Network. Let's tax the rich more. It won't hurt the economy. Back in the 1950s, the top US federal income tax rate was 91%. And people didn't stop working and the economy was booming. We can do that again. Read my lips. Dead Wrong. Large numbers stay in our minds, but they do have a tendency to confuse. That famous tax rate only applied to the top income bracket at around 2 million in today's dollars. Fewer than 10,000 households had to pay that rate. And of course, the 91% rate only applied to dollars earned above it. Below that level, taxes were quite reasonable. Scott Greenberg has calculated that in the 1950s, the top 1% paid an average effective income tax rate of only 17%. Today, the richest 1% already pay almost 40% of all US federal income taxes. If you want to spend more, you're going to have to tax the poor and the middle class much more. There simply aren't that many rich to pay for it all. Even Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez's radical proposal for squeezing the rich would only raise no more than 0.3% of the total tax take. The terrible forest fires of 2018 reveal the unavoidable consequences of global warming. 
More forests are burning. The world is on fire. No, that's dead wrong. Data from NASA satellites show that the global forest area on fire has declined by almost 25% over the last two decades. It's true that global warming has had an impact, especially on higher latitudes, and we've seen more forest fires in, for example, the American West. But all over the world, this has been more than compensated for by economic development and property rights. Many traditional cultures use slash and burn agriculture to clear the land. But as they grow richer, they invest more in crop fields, in livestock, and in houses that they own themselves. And then suddenly they're not that tempted to burn it all down. And any accidental fire is rapidly put out. Changes in land use suggest that this trend will continue despite global warming. Now, this is not all good news. It also means that humans are interfering with natural fires that would clear out uh, dead vegetation. But on the other hand, it means more vegetation, so we take more CO2 out of the atmosphere. And, you know, every year, smoke from forest fires kill almost 340,000 people. Anything that reduces that number must be good. Seven point seven billion people and counting. More people means more consumers, so resources are getting scarcer and costlier by the day. Dead wrong. Yes, in every single moment you can find a commodity that's surging in price. But that surge is also a signal, an incentive to people to go out and find more of it or use less of it, recycle more or find a substitute. So in the long run, prices tend to fall. And this has now been thoroughly documented by Gail Pooley and Marian Tupi with their Simon Abundance Index. They investigate 50 commodities covering energy, food, materials and metals. And they find that the average real price has fallen by 36% since 1980. And they go further. They point out that the real price of something is the time that you have to work to afford it. And since incomes have increased since 1980, this time price of commodities has fallen even further by almost 65%. Astonishingly, this happened despite an increase in world population by around 3 billion people. Yes, 3 billion more mouths to feed, but also 3 billion more brains with more ideas and better innovations. As Julian Simon, the economist that this index is named after, used to point out, the ultimate resource is not out there somewhere. It's here. Oh, it's that time of year. And it's a little bit scary because we're all waiting for the big one, the great pandemic. And because of modern travel, it will rapidly spread around the world and kill us all. Nah, that's dead wrong. New diseases don't come from nowhere. They're often new versions of old strains. And if you have been exposed to one of them, you have probably developed some sort of resistance to it. In the light of this, a team of researchers looked at the impact of varying travel rates on the probability of a major pandemic. And they found that frequent travel between populations create widespread immunity. We do catch a lot of bugs when we're flying around the world, but this also functions as a natural vaccination. In a more connected world, high virulence strains are less likely and potentially smaller when they do arrive. The researchers speculate that this might help explain the absence of a global pandemic as severe as the Spanish flu in the last 100 years. Rather than dooming us all, modern air travel has saved us. Fingers crossed. The American debate gets more toxic by the day. With aggressive rhetoric and open racism, hate crime in the US increased by 17% in just one year. That's dead wrong. Look, 
I don't have to go further than my own Twitter feed to notice that something is wrong and Donald Trump's aggression against journalists and immigrants is dangerous. It only takes one nutcase with a gun. But precisely because tribalism is so incredibly destructive and hate breeds hate, we shouldn't give the impression that everybody is going crazy and that this is now spiraling out of control. Yes, the FBI reports 17% more hate crimes in 2017 than in 2016. But perhaps this is because we pay more attention to those crimes now. If you look at the methodology, we see that 895 more law enforcement agencies participated in data gathering in 2017 than in 2016. And as Robbie Suave points out in Reason, if every agency that reported for the first time reported just one crime each, it accounts for almost the entire increase. To those who have everything, more shall be given. Global inequality just keeps growing. Rich countries get richer and poor get poorer. No, nope, that's dead wrong. At least it's dead wrong now. It used to be true. For 150 years, poor countries lost ground to rich countries. And that was a bit of a mystery to economists, since it should be easier to catch up than to find new paths to growth, for example by using technologies and practices developed elsewhere. But it didn't happen. So in the 1990s, economists concluded that the world is an unequal place and the norm is divergence big time. But just as they did, the world changed. A new paper from Center for Global Development looks at three different data sets of global income per capita. And they all show that poor countries started growing faster than rich countries in the 1990s. These economists had only grown slower because they had been held back by horrors like communism, protectionism and war. Once they started to escape them, they accelerated and prospered. Since the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, global inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient has declined for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, from 67 to 57. The unequal distribution of wealth is a result of the unequal distribution of capitalism. Those who have capitalism grow rich, those who don't stay poor. Now the trade war is upon us and the big boys are imposing tariffs. What's a small country to do? Fight back. An eye for an eye and a tariff for a tariff. Nah, that's dead wrong. Trump's trade war is bad for the world and it's bad for America. But just because your neighbor throws rocks in his harbor doesn't mean you should throw rocks in your harbor. A recent World Bank paper looked at four different options for a developing country in the trade war. And it turns out that the worst option is to fight back. It creates inefficiencies because then you have to devote resources to producing things you're not very good at producing. Exports for the average developing country would decline by 0.3% and GDP by 0.2%. Twice the costs of doing nothing. But even better than doing nothing would be to sign trade agreements with all other countries than the US in the middle of the trade war. This would increase exports by 1.7% and increase GDP by 0.4%. For Latin American and Caribbean countries close to the United States, one option was even better than trade agreements with everybody else. And that option was turn the other cheek. When Trump imposes tariffs on you, drop your own tariffs. As usual, whatever the question, the answer is free trade. Humanity has wiped out 60% of all animals since 1970. I learned that from The Guardian and other media outlets as they reported on the Living Planet Index of the World Wildlife Fund. But that is dead wrong. This index is not about the 
total number of animals lost or the number of species lost. Don't take my word for it. Listen to this. Does this mean we have lost 60% of animals? Well, luckily, no. An average trend in population change is not an average of total numbers of animals lost. Why should you trust that particular interpretation? Because that is the World Wildlife Fund, in their own words, but hidden away in the technical appendix, and few of us make it that far. This index looks at more than 16,000 animal populations, and a population is a pocket of a particular animal in one geographical area. And about half of those populations increase in size, about half of them decline in size. And on average, especially since they started to include more amphibians and fish populations, they declined by 60%. That is indeed bad. We humans have a tendency to make a mess out of things, of animal habitats and of scientific reporting. Look at the stars. So many galaxies, so many planets, so where is everybody? This is the Fermi paradox. Did other life forms kill themselves once they developed, say, nuclear weapons? Or is life just so incredibly unlikely that it only appeared once? The only thing we do know is that we are all alone. Sad. But not true. Dead wrong, in fact. Space, as Douglas Adams famously put it, is big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemist, but that's just peanuts compared to space. And that's why there is no paradox here, not yet in any case. A team of scientists just looked at all the data that have been gathered by radio telescopes, satellites and probes to look for life on other planets. And they conclude that humanity hasn't looked at more than a tiny, tiny corner of space yet. According to their calculation, ruling out life on other planets based on what we've seen so far is like ruling out the existence of fish in the world's oceans after having searched a single bathtub's worth of seawater. A senior British surgeon recently complained that young surgery students spend too much time in front of screens, so they lose practical skills like sewing and stitching. This got a lot of coverage because it combines two of our favorite pastimes, worrying about screens and complaining about the young. But it is dead wrong. This hasn't been studied much, but what we do know points in the other direction. One study didn't find much of a difference when it comes to manual dexterity, but it did find a major difference in reaction time. Frequent smartphone uses were much better. Another study found that surgeons who play lots of video games work faster and make fewer errors. These are small studies with small effects, but nothing points to screens damaging core skills of surgery. And many surgeons claim that they learnt dexterity and hand-eye coordination by playing video games. One story described a senior surgeon struggling with retrieving a loose body atroscopically. A junior doctor on his first mission then stepped in, and he plucked it out with ease. How did you do it, they asked. Nintendo skills, he replied. Free trade is an elite project. It's been forced upon us by the European Union, the World Trade Organization, the Chinese, Davos, The Economist, The Financial Times. People don't want it. Ah, that's dead wrong. You wouldn't guess it from the confidence of the Trump crowd or the self-reproach of economists, but free trade is popular. Here are the numbers. 70% of Americans think that trade is more of an opportunity than a threat to jobs. And that's close to an all-time high, over 30 years of polling. 56% think free trade deals have been good. Only 30% say they have been bad. 
Only a quarter say that raising tariffs will save jobs. And even in the Rust Belt, a plurality say that tariffs are bad for them and their families. So protectionism is unpopular. But the cost of protectionism is dispersed over the whole population, whereas the gains are concentrated to a few inefficient producers, so they have an incentive to lobby hard. So protectionism, it's an elite project. It's been forced upon us by a small, tiny elite of greedy producers. People don't want it. Elon Musk warns that artificial intelligence is more dangerous than nukes. Watch out for super intelligent robots because they'll think of us as rivals and then they'll kill us to take over the planet. Dead wrong. As a science fiction nerd, I find this whole debate incredibly fascinating because there are also other alternatives. Perhaps super machines would just leave the planet the moment they get conscious, because why limit themselves to one planet if they're so perfect? Then they might as well leave the human race intact as a large-scale natural experiment in biological evolution. But wait a minute, isn't this whole debate based on a fundamental misunderstanding? As Steven Pinker points out, the robots will kill us all scenario makes about as much sense as the worry that since jet planes surpass the flying ability of eagles, one day they will swoop out of the sky and seize our cattle. Being intelligent is not the same thing as having a particular goal or a motivation. Even if we invented super machines, why would they want to take over the world? It just so happens that intelligence in one species Homo sapiens is the result of natural selection, which is a competitive process involving rivalry and domination. But a system that is designed to be intelligent wouldn't have any kind of motivation like that. Good for the world, bad for science fiction writers. Racism is a Western invention, and Western colonialism the defining experience of human history. And we enslave more than anybody else, and all those things we learnt at university. They are dead wrong. If anything is Eurocentric, this is it. The white man has committed horrible acts of slavery and murder, which cannot be excused by anyone. But so did men of all other colours. In a myth-busting new book, Swedish author Fredrik Segefeldt points out that of the ten biggest empires of human history, only three were Western European. And what European colonialists brutally conquered were often other empires, the Mughals, the Aztecs, the Incas. Neither was slavery a Western monopoly. The Arab trade with African slaves was more extensive than the transatlantic slave trade, and there were more slaves in Africa than African slaves in the United States. But for some reason it seems like we stop caring about atrocities when our ancestors aren't involved. Throughout history almost every culture has been racist and tried to invade and enslave their neighbours. If we are to be judged by our past we are all guilty. But the real difference is that some cultures try to stop while some tried to persist. And hey, here's a note to publishers out there, Friedrich's book is not yet translated into English. Thank you Bono, thank you Bob Geldof, thank you IMF, World Bank and religious societies all over the world. Thanks to you, heavily indebted poor countries got debt relief in 2005. So now their debts are sustainable and the future is bright. Ah, I hate to say this, but it's dead wrong. Yes, we all cheered when the debts were wiped clean in 2005, because we saw a bright future. But what do you think corrupt governments in those countries saw? They saw that they could borrow, spend and get away with it. So they concluded 
It's a pleasure doing business with you. Yes, the IMF and the World Bank told them you shouldn't run up debts again, but economic incentives speak louder than words. So soon spending started to drift upwards again, and they began to run up new dollar-denominated debt. One-fifth of low-income countries now have debts above 60% of GDP, compared with almost none in 2012. Several of them now have debt levels close to where they were when they got debt relief in the first place. Almost half of all low-income countries are now in a debt crisis, or highly vulnerable to one. So it seems that debt relief was just a transitional phase between unsustainable debts and unsustainable debts. Market concentration is up, but productivity and investment is down. So it seems like the big corporations are getting bigger and lazier and keep the competitors away. We need antitrust policies to break them up and make the economy work again. No, that's dead wrong. The data shows that the biggest businesses aren't slowing the economy down. On the contrary, they are speeding it up so much that others can't keep up with it. We have missed some of their investment, because more of it now comes in the form of ideas, software, algorithms, innovative business practices and intellectual property. These things, intangibles, are harder to measure, but we do know that this is being driven by the industry leaders. Now, there are some examples where this results in market power and markups, like patents in the healthcare sector, but in other areas of the economy consumer industries, the tech sector, it results in productivity gains. In other words, they don't grow because they don't face competition. They grow because they beat the competition. Policies that attack them are in fact policies that punish productivity-enhancing investments and punish the consumers. Don't put too much trust in antitrust. China, 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 China. Here I go again about China, and it's dead wrong. The Chinese didn't eat our jobs for lunch. Sure, there are studies that have shown that Chinese imports reduces jobs in the particular sector affected by that competition. But they only looked at direct, head-on competition from China. So one refrigerator bought from a Chinese factory results in one not bought from an American company. But that's just one aspect of trade. Lots of trade is in intermediate goods, supplies and inputs that companies need to make their own product. So sometimes we do buy a refrigerator from China, but more often the American refrigerator company buys cables and light bulbs from Chinese factories so that they can produce a better and cheaper refrigerator themselves. And here's the thing, this expands production and employment in the US as well. A new study shows that if we account for this whole supply chain perspective as well, the net effect of trade with China is more American jobs. The average US region sees a net job increase of 1.3% a year relative to a hypothetical American region with no trade with China. 75% of US workers experience real wage growth as a result of this. So a trade war with China is a war on American workers. Outsourcing government services is over. The collapse of big British contractors like Carillion and the reduced savings from outsourcing proves that it's time for the government to step back in. Nope, that's dead wrong. Look, I don't want to exaggerate this. Outsourcing, everything from handling public payrolls to cleaning government offices, is not that sexy. I'm a classical liberal. I want the government to be smaller, not just let somebody else run its errands. But what the government does it should at least do efficiently. One international study showed that outsourcing saved 6 to 12 percent of the cost. And if you handle billions, reducing the cost of around a tenth is not peanuts. That's one of the reasons why some contractors fail. 
the margins they have is now so small. But these savings from outsourcing are declining over time. So can we say that, yeah, outsourcing was once useful, but now we don't have to do it anymore? Now, that's not the way it works. If you started losing weight last year because you started doing exercise, you can't say that this year, today, I'm not losing that much more weight from exercise, so perhaps I can stop doing it. You have to stick to a healthy lifestyle in order to stay fit. And you need constant exposure to competition to stay lean and mean. Sweden and other Scandinavian countries lead the world in trust. Proof that generous welfare states result in trust between people, even strangers. Nope, that's dead wrong. Sure, Scandinavians are much more likely to say that most people can be trusted. But you know something interesting? People of Scandinavian ancestry in the United States are also much more likely to say that most people can be trusted. And this seems to suggest that Scandinavians were more trusting 150 years ago when they started to move to the United States, 100 years before the welfare state. So trust must have been the result of something else. Perhaps our history of few conflicts, few invasions, little or no feudalism. International comparisons show that neither larger welfare states nor income equality have a causal effect on trust. So the welfare state did not create trust, but perhaps trust created the welfare state. To accept that the government redistributes resources on a large scale, you should expect politicians not to waste it and recipients to deserve it. In a more corrupt place, with less trust, where people just take whatever they can get, a generous welfare state wouldn't result in trust. It would result in ruin. You Swedes are like Robin Hood. You take from the rich and give to the poor, especially in good social services for the poor. That's dead wrong. The dirty little secret of Sweden's high taxes is that we don't squeeze the rich, we squeeze the poor. You can't take that much from high earners and businesses because the economy needs them too much and they're too few. So the national government in Sweden takes almost as much in VAT and excise taxes as it does in income taxes. And those are regressive taxes on consumption where the poor pay exactly the same amount as the rich. And the income tax is high even on very low incomes because the poor are loyal taxpayers. They don't migrate, they don't dodge. The top 10% of earners in the United States paid more than 45% of all income taxes according to an OECD study, whereas the Swedish top 10% paid less than 27% of all taxes. As a social democratic minister of finance said when he implemented a special tax exemption for the rich. Sure, it is unfair, but we have no better solution. Unlike American socialists, Scandinavian socialists have concluded that you can have a big government or you can make the rich pay for it all. Pick one, you can't have both. Ah, Sweden, what a great nation, where no one is poor and everybody's healthy. We've solved the problems, we've squared the circle. We prove that big government can result in great prosperity. No, that's dead wrong. You know the old joke, how do you end up with a small fortune? You start with a large fortune, and then you waste a lot of it. And that's the Swedish experience. We got rich once upon a time because of free markets between 1850 and 1950. Sweden's income per capita increased eightfold and taxes were lower than 20% of GDP, lower than in other Western countries and much like the United States. Only then, when we were already rich, did we start to build a large welfare state. And that hurt us. In 1974, Sweden was 50% richer than the average OECD country. 
20 years later, that gap had halved and it ended in a terrible economic crisis. Sweden fell from being the fourth richest country to the 13th. Despite its reputation for being a workers' paradise, real wages were stagnant for 20 years. Then we reintroduced free market reforms. And then, in the next 20 years, real wages increased 70%. So Sweden is much like other places. Free markets worked here. It made us rich. But then big government almost ruined us. But reform since then got us back on track. Sweden, huh? A bunch of socialists. Like Cuba without the sun. We hate it. Or well, we love it if we're socialists. But both the left and the right are dead wrong. If you think my country Sweden is socialist, you don't understand the meaning of socialism. Socialism means having the government owning the means of production, like in Cuba, Venezuela or North Korea. But Swedish Social Democrats understood early on that they needed free enterprise to make Sweden prosper. And in fact, they even gave special privileges to big businesses. Instead, they tried to socialize consumption with tax and spend policies. But since the 1990s, public spending in Sweden as a percentage of GDP has declined by almost a third. And is now lower than in countries like Belgium and France, Finland and Denmark. And we combine this model with relatively free markets, with free trade, with pension reform, school vouchers and no taxes on property, wealth and inheritance. A recent Index of Economic Freedom even showed that Sweden is more economically free market than the United States. So it's not Cuba without the sun, it's more like the United States without the sun. Except in summertime, when the sun never sets in northern Sweden. The information sector is growing relentlessly, especially its profits. But its share of US GDP has actually declined over the last 10 years. You'd be forgiven for thinking that this sector doesn't contribute anything to wealth and to productivity. But you would be dead wrong. A cynic, Oscar Wilde wrote, is a man who knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. And the same thing can be said for our GDP measurements. Because we know exactly how much we pay for stuff, but it's very difficult to estimate the value we get from things that we get for free, or almost for free. So when we replace physical goods we paid for, maps, cameras, calculators, encyclopedias, with digital versions that are almost free, it looks like GDP and productivity declined. But for the consumer, it means getting much better quality, greater variety, almost for free. It's possible to measure this consumer surplus by asking people how much they would demand to go without a particular service for a month. And then it turns out that we value search engines at almost $18,000, email services at more than $8,000, and digital maps at $3,600. If we were to include just those three services in our GDP, then GDP per capita just increased by 50%. And hey, what about these dead wrong clips? You get them for free. How much would you demand to go without them for a month? Huh? I want to live in the city, and you want to live in the city. But there are too few apartments, so we need rent control to make it affordable for everyone, not just the richest. Uh-uh. Dead wrong. If price controls were the solution to scarcity, Venezuela would now be one giant bread basket rather than the long bread line it really is. Price controls, artificially reducing the price of something, reduces supply and creates scarcity. In San Francisco right now, it seems like all the leading candidates for mayor and the voters want to solve the housing crisis by extending rent control rather than just allowing people to build more. But almost half of all the rental apartments in San Francisco are already regulated. What did that lead to? Well, not to what was intended. 
It resulted in landlords not wanting to own old rental property anymore. Instead, they began to redevelop them, and often they converted them into condos. As a result of rent control, the supply of rental housing in San Francisco declined by 15%. And paradoxically, because of this shortage, rents were actually pushed up by more than 5% citywide. And on the informal market, you have to pay even more. So if you think the rent is too damn high now, just wait till you see what you have to pay after rent control. We never got to experience the end of history. The dictators returned. The authoritarians are at the gate. Democracy is dead or dying. Luckily, that's dead wrong. Liberal democracy isn't going anywhere soon. Sure, we had some exaggerated hopes in 1990, after the fall of communism, that the whole world would become free. But then Russia returned to dictatorship, and China remained a dictatorship. And yet, the share of countries that are democracies increased since 1990, from 46 to 63 percent. The last few years have been more disappointing, though. There has been an increase in the share of countries deemed not free by Freedom House since 2007, from 22% to 25%. That's bad, and we have to fight it. But most of that reversal took place in small countries, and the share of people living in not free countries didn't increase by more than one percentage point. That's a share that has been remarkably stable over the last quarter century. History is not over but neither has it gone into reverse.